Welcome to the College Game Day Podcast, uh, emergency hotel in the Greater Phoenix Area Edition. Uh, as those of you on YouTube can tell by the uh, residents in Marriott backdrops, the telltale signs behind Jeff Porzello and I. This is uh, Pete Demel, your Game Day Podcast host. I'm here with uh, my trusty partner, uh, Jeff Porzello, for another uh, college basketball. But this is uh, an emergency edition, Jeff. Uh, John Calipari is headed to Arkansas, the Kentucky coach, after 15 years, four Final Fours, I believe, Jeff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 35 first-round picks. Uh, I think without argument, the biggest name of a coach in college basketball is leaving Lexington or Fayetteville. This is axis-shifting news in the in the sport. Uh, Jeff, your immediate reaction? I just didn't think it would happen. I, I didn't think that Cal would actually leave for another job. Um, there's an argument to be made that Kentucky is the biggest job in the sport and a pretty good argument given that they're given their conference affiliation, their history, their resources. Um, there's obviously expectations that come with it. So people might not think it's the best job, but it's, I think it's the biggest job and, and now it's open and can, and Cal left for not just any job, a job in the same league. Um, and it just, you know, you heard whispers about it throughout the week and, Oh, you know, he's, he's, interested in it they're interested in him they're gonna make a run at him but until basically you tweeted that he was finalizing a deal i wasn't actually sure it was going to happen um just because he's he was giving up you know a, a lot of kentucky i mean he had that thing but from a recruiting perspective he was still rolling from an nba perspective he was still rolling um the fan base was disappointed in him when we spoke about that a couple of weeks ago um but i thought they were gonna have to force him out i didn't think he was actually going to do it himself um, and I didn't think he was going to do it at Arkansas. Um, it's, it's like you said, it's a, it's a landscape shifting move. It's a, it's a seismic move in, in the SEC in college basketball. And again, you know, the biggest job in the sport is now open. So I think Jeff, the hardcore college basketball fan probably knows how we got here. This is beyond Oakland. This goes back to, I believe one tournament win since, uh, 2019, and uh, just an erosion of the dominance that we saw for really yes. like that decade um, when he like, won the national title, was making Final Fours consistently. How do you explain to like the common fan, the bracket fan, how John Calipari got to this crossroads where he chose to leave for Arkansas? He would have entered next season on the hot seat. You know, another another season without multiple NCAA tournament wins, and he probably would have been fired at this point next season. Uh, the thirty three million that they owed him after this past season was probably enough to. Uh, give him another year. But once you get to the point where your athletic director has to release a statement saying you're coming back as the coach, you know, that's, it's, it's kind of hard to come back from that. And he had lost the, the uh, appreciation of the fan base, I guess I'd say. And like you said, it was, it was more than just the Oakland loss. It was more than the St. Peter's loss. He had essentially refused to adapt to the changes in college basketball roster construction. He was still going heavy on freshmen. Um, you know, he was going into the portal to get one or two guys, but he was still saying, OK, we're going to win young. We're going to win with freshmen. Uh, we're going to win with McDonald's All-Americans. And that hadn't really worked. Um, and like I said, he was still putting guys in the NBA. But the fan base was saying, hey, we don't want to consider a player good when he gets a $100 million contract. We want him to win championships at Kentucky. And uh, I just think that the final straw for most of the fan base was the Oakland loss. Because this past season, he had, he had shown at least a, a, an interest in modernizing his offense. I mean, they played faster. They shot more threes. So it seemed like he understood, hey, I have to change this, this, and this to move forward. But his press, the loss to Oakland and the press conference after where he said, we might go into the portal, we might not, we might be young. I, I just think it, some of the faith or whatever remaining faith the fan base had in Cal uh, was kind of eroded by that point. So you and I uh, have done this for a long time, Jeff, and we're around all these coaches around them at AU events, uh, spend a lot of time with them, talk on the phone with them. And I think one thing listeners probably don't have, have a grasp of that we do is that a vast majority of these big time head coaches are extremely insecure. Um, and, and I bring that up to say you're laughing for those of them listening yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and not watching. Um, how much of this move do you think is, is, is John Calipari, a man of a Hall of Fame coach of tremendous accomplishment? How much of it is him wanting to go somewhere where he's won. I think that's a huge part of it. I mean, he was going to go into next season. Like I said, he was going to go in on under on the hot seat and the fan and with a fan base that really no longer wanted him there. Um, you know, th there was a, a ton of calls to fire him last month. 
Um, and you know, when, when Mitch Barnhart announced he was coming back, there was some, there was disappointment, especially on social media and the fan base. And, and I think that he was that you know, part, part of the appeal of Cal when he had Kentucky rolling was it was, we're at the best job in the sport. We have the best fans in the sport. Um, you know, it's Kentucky eats first, all that stuff was, it was all Kentucky, Kentucky, Kentucky. If you don't have the fan base behind you anymore, it's really hard to sell that still. And so he's going to a place at Arkansas where when they have it going, you know, Bud Walton Arena is one of the best home court advantages in the sport. They have a tremendously passionate fan base. They have a ton of resources. It is a it is a really good landing spot for someone who kind of, you know, maybe wants to do what he was doing at Kentucky in 2012, 2013, 2014 and um, kind of reignited and, and, and reestablish it as one of the best programs in the country. And so I, I just it's it's a it's a fitting spot for for someone who really relies on, um, you know, we are the best and we have the best fans. We have this, this and this. He needs that that love and that support from the fan base to sort of get his message across. So as you and I talked yesterday, as this started to percolate, I think when I really started to take it seriously was, well, one, like the search had gone really quick, right? Yeah. Like these searches have these, there's a buzz here. They're talking to this guy. Chris Jans's name was, uh, was floating around as somebody interviewed yesterday, but like for a six, seven hour stretch, the, the, the search sort of went inert, which was just a signal that, that, that something was happening. And, and I think, the moment I started to take this seriously was when a few people told me that that John Calipari had a longstanding relationship with John Tyson. And John Tyson is the uh, billionaire with a B, Tyson food, Tyson chickens, uh, Teddy Thamel enjoys their nuggets, uh, dinosaur <laughs> shape. Um, and don't act like you don't enjoy the dinosaur shaped nuggets too. Come on. Oh yeah. I and mean, we were talking about this yesterday. Like how many leftover chicken nuggets do you eat every week? <laughs> too, too, too many probably. Right. Um, enough that, that I should be on the treadmill today uh, instead of, uh, instead of talking about John Calipari. That's for sure. Um, so with, with, with that relationship uh, to me, it, it signaled comfort and resource. And there's two things John Calipari is going to want. He's going to want all the private planes. He's going to want the big NIL cachet. He's going to want at Arkansas what he uh, what he had at Kentucky in terms of in terms of available uh, available resources. Like, and not to pick on these schools, but I don't think South Carolina or Mississippi State could have offered the same path. And I'm just picking on two lower end SEC schools, just g- generically, right? I don't think they have the the, the financial metal to to make a move like this. Um, so I guess I bring that up as a preamble to ask you, what do you think John Calipari at Arkansas could, could look like? Because I think this is a home run hire for Arkansas. Like, I mean, I, I, you know, for as much as, you know, John Calipari is perceived to be on the decline or in a funk, um, I don't know if, if you had hired Jerome Tang or you had hired Chris Jans or you would even hired Chris Beard. I, I don't, and Chris Beard is a very good coach. Um, obviously he would come with his own, his own set of baggage, but he, I, I don't know if like, I, I think John Calipari is just, a, just a win in, in some of it, Jeff, I think, and I'll be curious how you think it unfolds there, but this is show business, man. Like yeah. you, you and I on November 11th are going to be watching the first Arkansas game, right? Yep. And knowing John Calipari, it's going to be in Madison Square Garden. It's going to be somewhere big and bold. And it's the, it's the reality show that takes over the sport. I, I, I I'd have to about a little broader but i don't think there's anyone anyone's gonna be more excited to watch the first week of college basketball season and then what john calipari looks like coming out of the tunnel in a uh in a i don't know does he wear a three quarters zip or a tie these days uh three quarters in three quarters yeah so in a in a in a in a in a, in a white with a with a hint of red hue and in, in a hog in a logo with three quarters in. i mean I, I think it's it's telling that the biggest story going into next season in the sec a league that has kentucky a league that has Alabama, who just made the Final Four, a league that has Chris Beard and Bruce Pearl and whoever else, it's going to be Arkansas. And from that perspective, it's hard to view this hire as anything other than just a a, a huge statement. Um, it's it's it really. I mean, I think that's what it is. It's a statement of intent. It's it's we're Arkansas. We have the money to do this. We're going to fund his. We're going to fund a pretty sizable NIL budget from everything we're hearing, and we're going to go build you know the best rosters in the country. We're going to let Cal do what he did at Kentucky. And, you know, maybe he's not going to get the number two, number one recruiting class every single season um, like he did at Kentucky. But, you know, he was doing pretty well at Memphis when he was 
uh, when he was recruiting there. So I think he's still going to be able to go out and get McDonald's all Americans. And uh, again, I, I think he's going to have to, you know, adjust his, his roster construction mindset and go into the portal a little bit more um, as we've seen Arkansas do pretty effectively under Eric Musselman. It's, it's a place that transfers mm-hmm. have wanted to go. I mean, they have the facilities obviously. I mean, they have the, the fan base. It's the place where you can go and, and win. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, has, has Cal had Cal lost his fastball his final few years at Kentucky? Probably. But, you know, if you're Arkansas, this, again, this is a, a, a landscape shifting move. And now Arkansas is the biggest story in the sport on the morning of the national championship game. There's no other hire in the country that they could have made where they'd be the biggest story in the sport. And I just think from that perspective, uh, they couldn't have done better than this. True or false, Arkansas is in the final four in the next four years. I'll go through. I'll go through. I mean, I, I know it's, a, it's and again, I mean, Cal hasn't been there in a while, but yeah. I just think he's going to be, it's, I mean, the tournament's a crapshoot. And I, I think that sure. if you stockpile enough talent, you give your you give yourself a chance to get, I think Kentucky could have made it this year if they beat Oakland. I mean, it's, sure. again, it, it, it's, it's a, it's, it's a one game deal, but I think if you stockpile enough talent, which he will do, which he has consistently done at Kentucky, um, you know, eventually you're going to kind of, you're going to break down that wall and get into the final four. Does John Calipari shake up his staff significantly at Arkansas? And was this exit kind of a clean window for him to reboot? Because that was something I think, he, I think that was a, I think yeah. that was a struggle for John. All these guys who'd helped him for so many years, all these loyal lieutenants, um, the paradigms change. And, and maybe you don't need as many recruiters as he has on his staff. Maybe you need a little different shift. Do you think that staff come, you know, the next few weeks looks a lot different? I think it needs to. Um, I think he needs to go out and, and, you know, I think he can, he needs, first of all, he needs probably a, a, an X's and O's guys that will come in and, and make sure the offense that he was running this past season can be tweaked to some extent to whatever roster he builds at Arkansas for year one. I mean, he's going to essentially have to rebuild Arkansas's entire roster. Now, do, does the Kentucky freshman class recruiting class come with him to Fayetteville? You know, that remains to be seen. But I, I think he's going to have to continue to play the way he did this past season. And he doesn't need, like you said, he doesn't need, you know, three or four recruiters on his staff anymore. It's a when you have the NIL budget that he's going to have and you have the portal, which he's going to need to use. You don't necessarily need guys that will that have longstanding relations, relationships with, you know, high school power brokers where you can recruit a guy for 18 months to, to get his commitment. They're going to need guys that will go in the portal, get guys in two weeks and rebuild this roster to compete in year one. Um, so it is, it is a chance for him to, to kind of have a clean break and, you know, he doesn't have to get rid of everybody, but he doesn't need to probably, he probably needs to shake up his staff uh, moving forward in Arkansas. Quickly, before we talk about what's next at Kentucky, uh, you broke the story this morning, Aaron Bradshaw, the uh, talented big man uh, is in the portal, the first domino to fall after uh, John Calipari's move. Is he going to follow him? Is that the, is, is there an early feel on the street, Jeff, or is it too early? I, I don't think he's a lock to follow Cal. I mean, there, there okay. have been whispers the past couple of weeks and even past couple of months that he was going to consider transferring. Uh, he, had, he had a pretty up and down freshman season, you know, barely played the final two months of the year, had a foot injury that kind of delayed his his debut. So um, I don't think he's a lock to Arkansas. I think he's going to have a pretty open recruitment. Can you go to Rutgers? That just the juggernaut dominant, uh, you know. Top hey, they need pick. they they need a they need a big man. They got the two sure. two lottery picks coming in. They do need a big man. It would be a return home for him. Um, now now, do they have the NIL funds after going and get Dylan Harper and uh, Ace Bailey? We'll, we'll have to see. But I'm sure they'll throw their hat in the ring. I think Indiana will throw their hat in the ring. And I think I mean I, I think Arkansas will probably also pursue him uh, to bring him to Fayetteville. So I think he's going to have his. His uh his choice of suitors. Well, uh, there will be uh, there will be a lot of buzz this week. So much for you going home and coaching soccer and getting some rest <laughs> and relaxation uh, until the very moment that Kentucky hires a coach. Uh, you did something for ESPN Plus last night where you kind of handicapped the field. Give me Jeff your three most realistic candidates. Uh, I guess let's start with where they shoot, and then we'll we'll distill that to real reality. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. Billy Donovan was the first name. Walk, walk me through the, the 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 Hail Mary list before we we get to the reality list. For yeah, I mean, I think the first call probably has to go to to any of Dan Hurley, Billy Donovan, Jay Wright. And I don't think Hurley's leaving. I mean, especially if he wins back to back titles on Monday night, 
I don't think he's leaving either way. He's a Northeast guy. He just doesn't seem to fit Kentucky. Billy Donovan has really shown no sign of, of wanting to come back to college. And again, he's got the Bulls in the playoffs so it'll be a, or the play-in game. So it's going to be at least a couple of weeks before he'd be able to take over. And then Jay Wright has maintained he does not want to coach again. Um, and I remember that one of the biggest things for him at Villanova was I can coach Villanova and then I can go live. I can live my life without being kind of under the microscope. I can raise a family. I can go out to dinner in Philly and not be bombarded. Can't do that in, in Lexington. Um, it's it's a full time 365 job to coach Kentucky basketball. So I just don't see that happening. Um, and then there's the other guy. You know, I don't know if a Nate Oates cannot happen, but I do know it will cost 18 million to get him out of his Alabama contract. And And no school has paid that. Um, to, to, I don't know about football, but it hasn't happened in basketball. What's the biggest basketball buyout to get a coach? We just saw Kalen DeBoer get twelve million in football, and that had kind of reset that paradigm. I mean, is there anything over five million? I mean, Ed Cooley leaving Providence for Georgetown was probably in that range, that five yeah, to six range. School, so yeah, right. Um, Oates would be three times that. T.J. Otzenberger would be three times that. Uh, Tommy Lloyd just signed a new contract. I assume his buyout is pretty sizable. I also don't think he maybe has the personality to fit. I mean, he's a West Coast guy his entire career. So you kind of get rid of a lot of names that would theoretically be on their call sheet if this was 10 years ago, and they can go get whoever they wanted. Um, so that's why I think the realistic names would be Scott Drew, who just turned down Louisville to return to Baylor and, and sign a new contract. From what I understand, the buyout is still not um, prohibitive. Mm-hmm. And if if he wants to leave, this would be a chance. I think Bruce Pearl, I think you're going to hear that name. Now, he has the same NCAA, issue, NCAA tournament issues that Cal has had. He hasn't been out of the first weekend since 2019 either. Um, and he's also 64. And, and so if you're Kentucky, do you want to start fresh with, you know, someone 45, 50 that certainly has 10 or 15 years of potential ahead of them? Um, but I do think he's probably going to be pretty high on their list of, of realistic targets. And after that, I think you kind of, you know, you could take your pick of, of you know, the Sean Millers, the Brad Underwoods, uh, you know, Mark Pope, you'll probably hear a link to it because he played there. But I, I don't think it's going to be, we're Kentucky, we could hire whoever we want. I think they're going to make some calls and get some no's uh, before making their hire. Do you think this is a quick targeted search or do you think this drags a little bit? They don't have any competition in the market right now. Um, they need to get this right. There's a tremendous amount of pressure on Mitch Barnhart, the athletic director. Do you think this is like a, shotgun 48 hour deal or do you think this thing lasts uh, you know long enough to maybe dangle billy donovan after his playing game which is in about 10 days? i think perhaps it's more likely to move quickly um i think that they probably had some sort of list of of targets back after they lost to oakland before they opted to bring him back um again they, they don't have competition like you said but you're going to want to kind of keep this freshman class together you're going to have to rebuild this roster Pretty quickly. And again, I mean, if this drags out until Billy Donovan's available, which could at the earliest is, I think, 10 days from now, by that point, a lot of guys in the portal are going to be already committed. Um, the portal closes on May 1st. And so there is some sort of there should be some sort of sense of urgency to I mean, you don't have to do it tomorrow. You don't have to do it on Wednesday. But I think you have to get whoever you hire. You're going to have to give them a fair amount of time to rebuild this roster. All right. Gun to your head, the next Kentucky basketball coach is? I'll say Scott Drew. Um, I just think he, you know, he has the the track record. Um, you know, he did flirt with Louisville a little bit, and he also doesn't have a an enormous buyout like the Nate Oates of the world. And so I just think there are a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, he ticks a lot of boxes uh, for Kentucky's next coach. And so we'll see if, if his return to Baylor after turning down Louisville was a lifetime thing or a, a three-week thing. Yeah, my understanding is his buyout is less than $5 million, which is yes. not a problem for, yep. uh, right. for, for, for Kentucky basketball. Very interestingly, if Kentucky had fired John Calipari, they would have owed him $33 million. By him leaving, he's not paying them a dollar. Um, right. So that just shows when you are established as he was and you have contractual leverage like he had, you can really have a mind-bendingly lopsided. <laughs> and, that's, and that's what that is. Um, to put a bow on the Drew notion, uh, Jeff, I think it's telling that Louisville's offer to him was not some like home run. You need to walk out of there. It right. was, it was through the prism of what he makes, which I think USA today has him in that like $6 million range. It's private. So it'd be the last available tax documents makes a good amount of money. He's a top 10 paid coach, you know, in, in the country. Um, they did not back up the Brinks truck. They gave him a 
fair and comparable offer. I think one point that we've seen accentuated throughout this carousel, and it's only going to be amplified moving forward, is that with the SEC and the Big Ten pulling so far ahead financially from everyone else, a place like Kentucky can offer Scott Drew $9 million. Right. right. They're paying John Calipari eight and a half. They can offer $8 million. And ACC schools, even blue blood types like Louisville, one of the five winningest programs in college basketball, may not have those caliber of resources going forward. I mean, they've had Pat Kelsey in the mid twos is my understanding. Um, so it's that's like coordinator money in the SEC um, in football anyway. So it's no, it's just that it's 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 different and. Yeah. We are going to see this power to notion become more and more distinct moving forward. And I really do think that Kentucky's process could be a, a further amplification of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I know they said, I know I said that they can't go out, out and get whoever they want, but the guys that, you know, like I said, Nate Oates is going to be the one that maybe they, that would be perfect, but that's competing against another sec school who has, you know, has made him a top five guy in, paid coach in the sport. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, if Kentucky wants to pay him or if he, if he says I'll leave for $9 million a year, Kentucky can pay that if that's who they want. Yes. And I think that's, that that's important here. Um, I don't think institutionally Kentucky wants to be flailing around and uh, being credited with an economic stimulus uh, award from, uh, yeah. from Washington DC and getting a bunch of folks raises. I do think Danny Hurley made a few extra million bucks um, yes. You know, there'll be a little cloud over the title game tonight, but win or lose, uh, he's done a remarkable job at UConn. Clearly historic. What is it now? They have won 11 consecutive NCAA tournament games by double digits. Nobody's ever done that before. They're certainly uh, there. And uh, there will certainly be some urgency, especially because of UConn's sort of precarious place in the football landscape. Um, I, I just think they need to, they will, there will be some urgency to relock up early at a, uh, at a top five type rate in the, uh, in, in the sport. He has certainly earned it, um, you know, be, beyond anyone else. And then from there, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how, um, you know, if, if it becomes a, a, them, them poaching or them uh, stimulating, because those are usually one of, the, one of the two things when a, when a big blue blood like Kentucky goes home. Yeah, and I'm assuming that they have already probably back-channeled the Billy Donovans and Jay Wrights of the world, and we're not going to get public denials from them. I mean, the Chris Beard and, and Jerome Tang turning down Arkansas, that was pretty public. I don't think we're going we're gonna to get kind of a an obvious Kentucky's moving down their list of guys. I think we're going to see them move. Um, like I said, it's got to be fairly quickly. And, and I think that, you know, it's going to be a quick, hey, would you be interested in leaving Scott Drew? And if he says yes, they move forward. If he says no... It's going to move right on to the next guy. Um, I don't think it's going to be very long, drawn out conversations with any of these guys. All right. Very good. Well, this will not be a long, drawn out podcast. We uh, we threw up the emergency flashers. Here we are, Jeff. Thanks for jumping on the Game Day podcast. Talk about the biggest news in sports today.